Hello, Oscillator Sync here. A few weeks ago, okay, maybe more like half a year ago, I posted a video which was titled Electron Syntax, the world's number one drone synth. Now that title was kind of tongue in cheek, right? What wasn't tongue in cheek about it was, um, in terms of the sound, I thought that the sounds that you can get out of syntax when you're using it in that particular way are, are, are fantastic. What is kind of uh, tongue in cheek is that syntax obviously is not a instrument which is necessarily designed for or aimed at that target audience of people making drone music. But like so many other electron boxes, the power of syntax comes from the flexibility of a number of smaller, simple systems. And by making use of those smaller, simple systems in flexible ways, we can make it do all sorts of interesting things. So in this video, I want to talk about using syntax as a drone synth. It's going to kind of be two parts to this video. The first is going to be sort of theory and mechanical stuff. There are a couple of things that we need to address about the way the syntax works in order to get it to do drones at all. And there are some differences between the machines and how we need to actually treat them in order to get things to drone. So we'll address that first. We'll get the sort of dry mechanical need to know stuff out of the way first. And then we'll go on and actually look at applying that and putting together a drone track, um, seeing uh, what things sound interesting, what tricks we can use. We'll talk about the composition a little bit, but um, if you're interested in uh, more of my approach to the putting together of compositions of drone tracks, uh, I would recommend taking a look at my Digitone uh, drone video. Uh, which is a couple of years old now, but um, a lot of the concepts that I cover in that are you know, obviously fairly easily transferable to the syntax. So we'll, um, we'll focus more on the sound design side of things rather than the composition side of things, I think perhaps um, in this video. The flexibility that the syntax offers us comes from the fact that on each of the different tracks, we're able to assign different machines. And these different machines can do uh, different things. So um, we've got percussive sounds, including snares, kick drums. Uh, we've got some utility stuff here on the analog ones. We've got uh, some melodic ones as well. And we have a different range on the digital tracks. And also uh, track 12 has a different range as well because that's geared more towards sort of symbols and noises. As I kind of alluded to, each of the different machines is going to have different drone capabilities, if you like. We have to treat them slightly differently um, depending on which machine that we're looking at. And we can kind of put them into three different categories, which is what I'll do in this first section of the video. And for each of those different categories, we have to use them slightly differently uh, within Syntax to get drones out. Whenever you load a machine into one of the tracks, the page which is unique to that machine essentially is found on the SYN page. And as we move to different um, machines, you get a different set of parameters. And the parameter that we're particularly interested in when we come onto this SYN page is whether or not we have decay parameters. And um, different machines have different decay behaviors. The um, first behavior that um, we're looking for on some of the machines is whether the decay parameters go up to infinity. And if they do, um, I put them in this category that I refer to as true drones. And I'll put a list of them up on the screen now. So with true drones, as long as you have got your um, individual machine decays set to infinite. And in the amp envelope, as long as you have, uh, depending on which uh, type of envelope you're using, if you're using the attack hold decay, you'll need your decay time set to infinite. And if you're using the ADSR, you'll need your release time set to infinite. But as long as you've got infinite uh, decay or release, depending on what um, amp envelope you're using, and you've got infinite decays on your SYN page, as soon as you play a trigger, it's going to be like connecting the uh, 
oscillator into a filter and then into a wide open VCA that is going to drone forever. This will never die down. And then you've got the opportunity to start playing with other parameters, of course, LFOs and all that good stuff. So the unique things about the uh, true drones, um, and this is different to all of the other machines, uh, all the other categories of machines, is that you don't actually need the sequencer going at all in order to make use of them as drones. You can simply be uh, mixing them in the, oh, if I chose the right track, that'd be useful. Mixing them in the mixer. Now, arguably, uh, not making use of the sequencer on an electron machine is illegal, but um, a good amount of what was actually happening in the performance that I posted was just coming from playing the mixer and bringing different tracks in. Uh, so it's a really nice way of working, actually. And of course, you could use um, uh, lock tricks within the sequencer on these tracks to not trigger the sound, but instead um, alter it in, in some way. The only way to get these to stop instantly is to either turn the unit off, uh, change your release to something that isn't infinite, or you can double tap uh, the stop button, of course, to kill that off. Moving on to the next category of machines when it comes to droning. Um, let's talk about something like this BD modern machine here. So the decay on this machine does not go up to um, infinite. And um, even if I come over to my envelope here, which is currently set to the AHD envelope, I have my decay set to infinite. We can clearly hear that at some point this um, dies away. Right, so it's not droning forever. And um, if I hold down the trig, this decay is still being applied. Still going to die down even though I'm holding down the trig. Now the trick here um, is that for the AHD envelope, the shape of the amp envelope doesn't have any effect on the synthesis. And essentially the decay that's defined in the SYN page uh, always wins. However, um, this isn't the only type of envelope that we have. It's the default one that's loaded when you first load in the machine, if you load up an initialized patch, if you load up an initialized pattern. But if we change this to ADSR instead, and now hold down the trick. As long as there is a gate, as long as the trick is playing, we get a drone. And some of these percussive sounds have some really interesting things going on inside them that shouldn't be overlooked. So the machines for which you can get them to drone as long as you are holding down a trig are referred to as my gate drones and I'll put a list of them up on the screen now. So everything that you see on the screen now are machines which will drone as long as you have something held down. In terms of sequencing these gate drones, because we are going to need to have a sequencer running if we're going to hear it, there are a couple of things to think about. So um, the obvious thing that you might want to do um, initially is to lay down a trig and set its length to infinite and that's going to make this trig last forever and when we hit play the problem now of course is that we're getting that trig at the start every single time now so what can we do well uh, this would be a useful uh, application of the first probability type or uh, trig condition rather and uh, what this does is only trigger this step the first time we play the uh, sequence so it's not going to trigger on every subsequent time around the sequence the thing that you need to know about this first trig condition however is that this applies to the first time around the sequence 
And if your track happens to be muted at that point, we're muting the trigs, not the sound. Um, it's the way that it works on um, on the dig uh, the diggy box and the actual boxes in general, um, certainly the modern ones. Um, so if we were to mute this track, what happened just then was our first trig, but the track was muted when it happened. And if I now unmute it, no sound. So um, the approach that you probably have to think about um, here is, and this is what I did on my performance, is making use of the mix instead. And maybe if you want a track muted at the start of the performance, you just turn it down in the mixer, but leave the track actually enabled in the sequencer so that that first trick still fires. So um, track was unmuted, that um, trick has fired. And if I turn up my track now, we've got that drone happening in the background there. Now, on some of the machines, you might be able to take the approach of trying to create a sound. Um, so if I uh, turn this back to being 100% instead, uh, try and create a sound which doesn't have a transient at the start, but most of these drum machines, no matter what you do, are going to have a transient. So I can turn my sweep down to zero, I can turn my modulation envelope down to zero. But um, when I press play, and each time it goes across, it's going to give us that little click anyway. Now, um, we can try and mitigate it. I've already done it here. Um, um, you probably want to have your amp envelope reset turned off anyway, so that your amp envelope isn't going to keep restarting uh, if you've got any movement going in there. But you could try and do an attack on here and turn that back on, but you're still going to hear that movement at the start of each bar. So you're probably still better off making use of the first trick condition and dealing with things in the mixer. The next um, consideration comes is what if I want to sequence this? Uh, very good question. Um, you probably don't want to put down another trig, especially one that doesn't have the 100% infinite length. Um, so what you'll probably want to be doing if you want to sequence things is making use of lock trigs instead and just changing parameters but not firing the, um, the actual sound, just making changes to it. The, flip side of this difficulty now is that because this first note is set to first it's now not going to trigger either so um, what you can do is put now we've killed the whole sound is put another trick here which is just a lock trick which has your default parameters on all the ones that you count as default and then micro time it all the way over to the um, the first step more or less and this is kind of what I was um, talking about at the very start of the video where um, we have a bunch of flexible systems here that we can um, make do this kind of thing but it might not be set up to do it <laughs> in the most instinctive way initially but once you learn those systems then the world is your oyster with uh, the electron boxes and uh, we shouldn't overlook some of these percussive machines that can uh, last forever. Pretty much all of the digital machines come under this um, banner. So, you know, there are tonal parts to our uh, snare drums. Um, some of the um, other percussion sounds have interesting modulation sat between them. actually sustain forever in a, in a way. <laughs> Some interesting kind of 8-bit things going on there actually. Yeah, so uh, 
uh, and uh, everything uh, other than bits comes into this as well. Bits is a true drone, but these other ones we can. On the other melodic ones, we can use as gate drones. Excuse this very boring sequence, but you get the idea. Finally, we come to our third category of machines when it comes to droning, and I'll put them up on the screen now. And unfortunately, these are the machines that you cannot make drone. So, um, unfortunately, this is mostly the um, most of the analog drum sounds won't drone with the exception of um bd hard i think which has uh, an infinite decay um so here's a snare sound and although we can make it go for quite a long time and i have tested this it goes on for it goes on for a, a surprisingly long time but this will eventually end you can kind of hear that it's fading away i'm not going to um keep on that down the whole time yeah, so most of the analog drum machines, apart from BD Hard, um, will um, eventually decay to nothing. Now, it may well be that you'll kind of be like, well, we can re-trigger it occasionally and maybe put a, an amp envelope on it. And if it has a sufficiently interesting sound that you want to make use of, then uh, by, by all means. But um, it doesn't matter how you have your amp envelope set up. Um, so I've got this one set up to ADSR with sustain uh, up full. But it won't sustain forever. This one again will go for quite a long time though, as it happens, I discovered. But it will eventually die away. I think it went on for a good few minutes when I tested it uh, and I did sit and test these until they actually died away yeah um, all of uh, those uh, machines that I have on the screen they will not uh, drone though some of them will go on for a very long time and some of them will have interesting decays so it might be worth persevering with and just re-triggering sometimes you know um, if you think they have a sound that you like then you know, you can make it work. In my video on droning with the Digitone, I put forward what I would probably consider a very sequencer heavy approach to creating a drone. Lots of conditional tricks, um, lots of long held notes, creating sort of polyphonic parts within the four tracks. And that really is down to the fact that the Digitone has only four tracks. You have eight voices of polyphony spread across them. But having only those four tracks, it makes it difficult to perform a drone in a more interactive way, if you like. Because on Syntac we have 12 um, different tracks, granted they're all monophonic, but because we have these 12 different tracks, we can take a bit more of an interactive approach with the composition of drones, or I like to anyway. Um, and actually build up things that we can perform more using the mixer, for example, to bring in different um, drones and therefore different harmonies um, based upon um, the relative positions of the tracks. And it can be a bit more of an interactive, uh, playable experience rather than one that you compose and then kind of press play and let evolve. So that's the kind of approach that I'm going to I use here you can absolutely use an approach which is a lot more sequencer heavy and that you can again just press play and it performs itself but um now that we have all of these tracks to work with i think it's a nice uh, thing to uh, attempt with syntax so that's my goal for this example so i think maybe i will start with a couple of the analog tracks and just get a nice drone going on here and a good reason to start with the analog tracks in, in my opinion is that because the two vco sorry the uh, dual vco uh, machine here has two vcos in the title there we have the ability to build up um, essentially a four note chord between say two of these tracks and blend them in and out bring notes in and out both in terms of uh the relative volumes of the tracks, but also we have the balance control, which is going to allow us to balance between the two different oscillators that we have going on. 
So um, track selected, dual VCO turned on, make sure our amp is set to have an infinite decay. This uh, machine is a true drone, so we should now just be able to set it going. Um, let's choose a key. Well, let's go with F perhaps, uh, seeing as I've clearly already changed this note to F. Um, and let's find Just go for the classic fifth. Fourth is nice, maybe take it down an octave. And we can play with the um, waveforms also, probably not quite a, a fourth as detune it so it beats a little bit. And um, maybe go for. slightly less aggressive waveforms but then overdrive them goodness me to get a little bit more I could try some of the ring mod ones as well Let's get something nice and deep happening to begin with. So we have those two friends there. Um, let's uh, pan it off to the side a tiny bit and uh, come across to the next track. Go to that same machine and build up a similar sort of feeling patch. Just pan it out to the other side a bit. Uh, should just be able to get it going. So maybe get that one a fifth up from the root and then something a little bit more interesting going on there. We take a similar sort of approach with our
So, um, I'll get some more movement in here with LFOs in just a second. But what I want to do first is I want to bring everything through the analog distortion. So uh, let's go into the routing here and let's just put... You can hear immediately there as I put these tracks in there, the way that they start interacting becomes much more interesting. And, you know, distorted. And we'll just run everything in there, including our effects. Let's just check to see how much drive we have here. Maybe, maybe back off just a bit because we're already running pretty hot in there. Yeah. Uh, so um, I think one of the things that we could do um, to introduce some movement into this uh, straight away is maybe assign our LFOs on these first two tracks and maybe this one as well to the balance of those two oscillators. So we get. different harmonies happening there just by virtue of these things fading in and out so we'll come into our LFO page uh, remember with the LFOs that we have two different settings here we have the BPM version and we have the non-BPM version the non-BPM version is going to be based around uh, an implicit BPM of I think 120 BPM but if you want to get LFOs that go really slow, uh, the best way to do it is to use the BPM one and make sure your BPM is low. So let's go down to you know, 40 something. Slow. I'm making drone music. Uh, yep. And we want to come into the sin balance here. And we can pretty much go 15 each direction, I think. trying to aim for one of the sort of integer values here. Uh, so if we just uh, copy that page and paste it over here. I'm just going to go at a slightly different speed so they don't line up. introduce um, a couple of other sounds in here. Uh, one that I really like to use is on the digital ones, the uh, bits, which is another one of our true drones here, which we can set the thing to infinite here. Part of the reason I like this is, again, we get the two oscillators in here so we can build up a bit of a um, chord within here. Uh, but there's also just these really nice interactions between the sample rate reduction and the bit rate reduction, especially when your detunes aren't quite sort of spot on. So you can kind of hear everything sort of beating up against the distortion now. If we um, take things out of the distortion just for a second. You can hear how much that distortion is actually playing into the movement in the sound. And it's arguably a little bit too much with all these things going on at the moment. So again, we can just come into the FX. Just bring that drive down a bit. As we bring in more things, it's going to become... Uh, there's going to be less headroom in it, so that makes sense. So I think maybe we tune this one up a bit. Cool. 
we've got all of this glisten and, and scrunch that we can get from the sample rate reductions. Just take some of that down, but then use the resonance just to bring the top end back a little bit. Probably also here want to just take the very bottom end out of this one. Let's give us a bit more headroom. And then yeah, the sample rate reduction gives us loads of lovely varied timbres, so maybe like 20 up and down from there. This is what I mean about being able to mix it and bring in different chord tones using the mixer. Uh, so, uh, yeah, let's uh, get a bit of sample rate reduction moving. Again, really slow. And about 20 up and 20 down, I think. And the sample rate reduction, the bit rate reduction are especially interesting when your two oscillators inside the bit aren't quite in tune. The way that the sample rate reduction starts to create new harmonics on top of that is really, really interesting. You can almost hear that there's a pitch drift in it, even though there's not, and that's just that sample rate reduction moving around. I was thinking I might put a pitch drift in this one, but it doesn't sound like I need it. So I think maybe just a filter movement might be nice. Let's do that. Nice and slow. Not too much movement. And maybe let's take the same track and bring it over here and uh, tune it differently. side as well. Okay, it already is tuned differently because I happen to have it a different note on this track. Later, it's going to spend more time at either extreme. That might be really cool. Uh, so come in here. So instead of filter frequency, let's use the T tune, and we just want like 0.5, and we use a sine wave. Down. 
Okay. There's something going on here. Let's think about effects. Now it's probably mandatory for us to involve a little bit of reverb in this uh, drone setup. It's just going to give us a little bit of extra width and sort of space, um, which is going to be a nice thing. So um, let's just start one of our drones going up so we can more easily hear what that reverb is doing to either side of the stereo. So let's get this little one going. Uh, which we'll turn down a little. Uh, let's bring some reverb in there, a healthy amount of reverb. Then our reverb setup here, we're probably going to make it longer. Which makes it a little bit more evident on the other side if you listen in stereo. Our pre-decay is we'll probably make it shorter because we want our sounds to very much be in the reverb. Also notice that if you modulate the pre-delay, you do get interesting chorusing happening. And we can do that in the master track, might be interesting. And then probably the other thing we want to do is just take a bit more of the bottom end out of our reverb and also some of the very extreme top end. But at the same time as taking out top end feeding into it, let's give the feedback path a little bit more top end regeneration. Okay, let's bring some of the other tracks into the reverb now. Reverb is also going into our master distortion, so it's going to be contributing to that interaction between the different parts as well. probably want to think about uh, delay as well. Uh, let's get one more drone in here and then get some sequencing running. Um, which one? Let's try... Um, Maybe um, let's maybe use a gated drone here, so we have to get the uh, sequencer running. Um, let's maybe use um, let's use tone uh, sort of FM.
So I think probably just get our modulation and feedback moving with the LFO there would be quite nice. Obviously, but not so much sweeping in and out like it is currently. Maybe more kind of that speed. And also our feedback. For this for sequencing, um, I am going to probably use the first trick so that uh, this note always starts happening when we first start the sequencer and goes on uh, infinitely. But I might put some other notes in here as well. So uh, right track, put a trick down, condition is going to be first. The length is going to be infinite. I'm also going to make sure that my amp envelope is set to not reset. Good. And now we can finally start our sequencer. So if we do uh, polymetric tracks, they all run over each other and they don't ever reset.
So let's start to get some um, some more incidental sounds in here. I think would be nice. So we will come to our final analog track here, and we'll do some filtered noise kind of stuff. So not drones, but just some other little noises to happen in there. Uh, so. filter because bandpass pass is beautiful. we can uh, manually program in a bunch of notes here and just set them all at low priority, low probability even. So let's set this going uh, just actually save things first uh, so I don't lose anything. Uh, that's the paranoia in me. Uh, so what was I doing? Setting this. Oh. I should just set that to my slant too, like an idiot. Does that also mess with this track? No, good. So what I'll do is I'll put down a bunch of little twinkles. Probably set them off grid. So I'm just tuning the uh, filter manually into different um, notes. Which uh, should be interesting because they'd be slightly out of tune. kind of have to do it this way rather than playing in the notes because the um, filter doesn't track faults per octave essentially you can't play it directly with the keyboard which is a shame. so much on the grid so I'm just going to randomly just micro-tune these in and out a bit. I'm also going to make it slower in a second. Um, I think I want to also have these happening on different sides a little bit so I'm just going to pan them. Should I do it with an LFO instead? I think they're going to happen so sporadically that you won't really notice that the same note is happening in 
the same place each time. So we'll just give them a little bit of panning. What I might adjust with NFO is the attack parameter here, so some of them aren't pings. Some of them are sort of breathy. So what, up to even 50 something might work. So if we put it at the bottom so it biases towards the lower ones. Uh, so we'll use a holding trick here. So it chooses a new one for each step. Random. We're going to set this to attack. Uh, there it is. And we'll put depth of 40, but that will mostly bias it down back towards one, so the most of them will be plucky. And we'll get breathy friends as well. So I think I'd really like to um, get... Um, oh, I want to make this much slower and not happen all the time, don't I? Uh, before we do anything else. So let's set the probability down to like... 15 and have it... Uh, oh, it's already going slowly, that's fine. So only 50% of the time we're going to get a friend in here. And then it's going to be breathy or plucky. drone around a little bit. This one feels like it could be darker now that I'm here. stuff happening. Before we stop, um, a couple of things that I want to add in here. The first is I want to get the de delay involved, and the second is I want to make use of a couple of the digital algorithms which are a little less obvious for drones, a little more esoteric. So um, let's do that. It's a bit hypnotic, isn't it? I keep losing track of time. <laughs> this is necessarily going to be a long video because it's about drone, so Okay, uh, yeah. More esoteric machine, then some delay. Okay, let's put our low note back in. There it is. Um, and uh, that's an empty track. Yes. Um, so uh, let's make use of, say, let's try the symbol, right? So. The symbol, once we have things set up to be ADSR, which is here. We have this kind of ringing kind of thing going on. Um, but we have ways to actually create, like, chords in here and stuff. Or these sort of... filter them a little bit, take the bottom hand out.
I've drove it a bit. Yeah, I reckon we do something with that. Let's just bring in some other notes here. Perhaps we can sequence the shimmer to get these different chords and the radio as well. Quite a range of different sounds we can get here. Yeah, so let's do that. Let's um, let's pop a trick down here. Infinite. Set infinite to the default. Set this to be first. Uh, unmute the track would be a good idea as well. Uh, that one. in some uh... okay we'll have that going on in our phone in a second but let's put that on our phone now uh, mod and slow but fairly deep
Right, let's get our delay happening in here as well, because it's another way that we can build out our stereo uh, width a little bit and give it a little bit more movement. So I'll just come into my delay settings here, um, set it wide-ish, get it to ping pong. Take out the top and bottom end from the feedback so it's a bit more sort of tapey. And I'll just, sorry for the sudden disappearance of sound, but let's use this because it's a bit more plucky to work out whether it's sounding right. side because we've got the ping pong giving us width but if we turn up too much it's going to sound like that sound is happening on both sides rather than spreading across see now we can hear it building up on the other side and it's losing its position a little bit so maybe something around 56 
Dark Reverb is applying an LFO to the parameter which will make their pitch shift around a little bit. So um, if we come into the FX here, and we come into our LFOs, we've got two LFOs here, we can do them both of them, I guess. Um, so if we go to our reverb pre-delay, and just set a really slow and shallow bit of movement there. You can hear it as I sweep the depth. It starts to wobble a little bit. four more tracks here but I think the video has been going on for long enough other things that we can take advantage of is performing the drive so if we feel like we could actually take this a little bit Alternatively, uh, you could start with a high pass, and taking out some of the bottom end. So get filtered. 
You've then got the lovely interaction between the drive and the filter as well. For taking more of that bottom end out. We can probably push it a bit further. You see what I mean about the Syntax being a much more performable drone? Or has the potential to be a more performable drone than the Digitone, maybe? Both lovely. I should probably combine the two, really. Love it. Bringing that warmth in. We should uh, discount some of the... Um, phaser sounds as well. <laughs> and why wouldn't you? The two fields as well. Gorgeous. Anyway, I could sit and play with this forever and I probably will when I stop the video. But, um, I should probably leave it more or less here. So if you enjoyed the video, thank you for chilling out with me. Um, please do leave a like. That's always really massively appreciated. And I think I'm going to do a couple more Electron videos pretty soon as well. So if that's your bag, then um, make sure you are subscribed to the channel so you don't miss out on any of those coming soon. But until next time.